and uh, it says preparing live stream. So uh, I'm sure, oh, have you got the thingy there? We've done that there, so that's good. I did. I'm just gonna check on my phone as always. Can't see it yet, but, um, but we might be there. Let's have a look. Uh, good, okay. Oh, there we go. Hi, Emma. Hello. We're in, we're in the room. I think we are. Brilliant, hi everybody. Um, welcome to another Facebook Live in Dog Centre Care. We've got the amazingly wonderful Emma Lee with us today. I've been really excited about this all week. Um, uh, so we're gonna be touching on quite a few things. We wanna talk a little bit about rescue because Emma's been heavily involved with rescue. Um, we're gonna be talking about some of Emma's work and also Emma's really good work regarding supporting and informing trainers to think again about their relationships with their clients and how to get best outcomes. So we're gonna to touch on all that. Emma, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited yeah. to be here. Okay, so, well, tell everybody, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure most people know who you are, but just, uh, who, who might not. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Emma, and also how your kind of journey into dogs. Okay, I, I can't even remember what I was doing like an hour ago, so it's very difficult to remember what I do on a basis. So um, I'm a trustee in the shelter. That's kind of the major thing, which is France's second largest shelter. Uh, it helps have a bit of context. And we take all kinds. We're urban, we're rural, so we get hounds. Um, we get a lot of working dogs. So 33% of our dogs are either hounds or gun dogs. Um, I'm working from a working background. We get a lot of dogs from protection sports and from the guarding industries. So we're 33 three of our dogs are percent of our dogs are kind of you know Malinois, German Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds and the rest are kind of everything else uh, so that's one side of what I do but I'm also other things as well so <laughs> I do have a private practice I do a lot of work with clients who've got dogs who've got aggression problems that's what I was doing this morning um, and I'm also involved in English education and other bits and pieces which don't seem to fit with my life now but I love still doing because I can't let them go. I think, um, you know, when I when I kind of did my usual little digging behind the scenes uh, on, on potential guests, I don't know how you find time to do it because, of course, you do your kind of language service as well, don't you? And you do your yes. kind of the other side of your educational side of things as well. Yeah, yeah. So I was teaching GCSE this morning. I went from a dog aggression case to teaching uh, GCSE to a, a, um, a wonderful Japanese student. It was great. I love that. I love that diversity. Um, I just collecting careers, you know, and then I don't like to let any of them really go. And I don't know what I'll be in 20 years time. And that's kind of cool. They all kind of link in a little bit, isn't it? Because there's obviously a, a very keen um, uh, strain there of, of education and bringing people together yeah. and communication. Yeah, always. I mean, my degree was, uh, I did my degree way back in the day and it was like, I couldn't even decide then. I picked up units from English and sociology and communication studies and, and uh, psychology as well. And then kind of got a little bit more refined and then went back and widened it again and took a degree in photography, um, which also the same things apply because when I was doing, starting to do clicker training, that's very much about your timing. And if you're a good photographer, you tend to be a really good clicker trainer um because you're really good at capturing the moment unless you're landscape and then you know that's a bit dreadful to be a good clicker trainer if you're but again that's about <laughs> the lighting and the right moment and so on um so very good at reading the the room photographers in general um so yeah i, I don't like to i i kind of, i think under everything is the idea of the journey of the learner because i like to think of us all as learning all of the time and i think that's really important to me and the other thing of that is kind of like the human psychology. I'm fascinated by humans who isn't and uh, that side of things. And I think that kind of sets me apart a little bit and why I like it, because I think a lot of dog trainers come into dog training liking dogs. <laughs> and actually what that wasn't why I ended up in the shelter, by the way. You know, I've done a lot of work for human charities and I sometimes have heard this from the um, the human charity side, you know, that if you are part of the animal mafia, that was somebody once called me a member of the animal mafia. I don't even know what that means, really. Um, but if you're part of that, then you mustn't like humans very much. And actually, it's the contrary. I really like humans. Um, dogs came along, but I know a lot of dog trainers kind of come into it and behavior consultants come into it with the kind of I like animals. <laughs> and I really don't like people very much or I don't understand people. or They're so much more complicated than I could have ever imagined that they would be. So yeah, it's the journey and our, our learning journey in life. How we get on as a species as well, that fascinates me. And culture, because I've lived in uh, four different countries and I kind of, you know, 
uh, I'm very fascinated by watching the cultural nuances and things that, that go on within a culture. So that too. So this is interesting for me because, uh, as you know, I, I kind of reference the emotional experience a lot about um, yeah. diving into that and thinking about what it is that we share and what it is that makes it very unique and special for us. And you've obviously been very interested early on in all those different strands that come in to make that individual emotional experience. And then when we have that, the importance then of finding ways to be able to communicate with each other, yes. regardless of those differences or those nuances. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think one thing is that has become very clear to me, you can go and live in a different culture, but underneath it, underneath the kind of, do I kiss people in the supermarket? Like I once kissed my elderly French neighbor in the supermarket. And it was like, honest to God, it was like I'd, I'd committed such a terrible social faux pas <laughs> that I couldn't even begin to like, and I knew it the moment I'd done it, I kind of went, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, we're supposed to shake hands. And uh, and as to what you're supposed to do but underneath it all we're all the same everybody understands the embarrassment of making a social faux pas uh, you know we're all human beings at the base of it and no matter whether you're Brazilian whether you're Japanese whether you're French everybody's got that universal human experience and we all want to relate which I think can be very difficult for us to understand really sometimes when people seem so alien and do such weird things and you think why are you doing that <laughs> you know and even ourselves um you know because part of that journey who am i who, who how do i relate to the world and how do i fit into to things um uh, what am i feeling what am i thinking so, so a lot of it's coming from that place as well i think this is really important when we think about some of the shifts that we're seeing in the industry right now in the community, because we have had a heavy training bias in the past, which which is mm -hmm. a very kind of task orientated side of things. And I think I guess if you did come in thinking, oh, you know, I don't like humans much, but I do love animals and then the, oh, I, I can train animals. That's a, that's a career for me. Uh, you can get lost behind that task orientated approach then without thinking about anything other than, than that side of things. Uh, and um, recognizing a more of a care approach is about understanding what connects us all including yeah. our dogs right because yeah. Yeah. uh yeah. you know you mentioned earlier who was it i come i think it was kathy sado you were quoting about yeah the, the first the first answer to every question should be compassion yes yeah, yeah. She was quoting, um, because obviously we're in competition with the wonderful Mike Shikashio Dog Aggression Conference this weekend. And so Kathy Sadeo slot yesterday, she was talking, I think it's from Father Greg Boyle. Um, she said, the, assume that the answer to every question is compassion. And I think, you know, it can be very alien. You know, I'm working in an alien community with people whose experiences of animals and whose use of animals is not necessarily something I agree with um, but understanding underneath it all we're all human I think is so fundamental like for instance I'm I'm not secret about being vegan sometimes I'm not very you know evocative about it uh, it's just who I am and I don't feel like I need to go around proselytizing all the time um but you know that I've got complicated understanding of of hunters and we have a lot of hunters around here um and one day I was having a conversation with a hunter and just we were just chatting and he said oh he pulled up his car um, by the side of the road because I was walking all I had I think I had five dogs at the time most of them were kind of um mutley big 45 kilo plus dogs and he stopped the car he wound down the window and he nodded you know that you obviously like dogs and he said uh, you've got a good uh, the word in French is mut you you know you've got a good pack there and I kind of went yeah not very good for anything and he said um and we were just chatting and he's like what do you feed <laughs> and I'm like oh you know just dog food and dog stuff and sometimes baguettes and sometimes a bit of this and that and he was and he said and where do they all sleep <laughs> and I said well they just sleep where they want to sleep you know some sleep and this little one because I'm a little cocker spaniel she sleeps on the bed and he went and this is a moment of real complicity and I just loved it this moment of connection and he leaned out the window and he went mine too he said I've got seven and they all sleep in my bed because there's nothing better than a hot water bottle and I think you can be so divided by this you know I've been on anti-hunt protests against fox hunting I'm not shy about it that's part of my teenage youth um and still find tension when there's hunters right outside our shelter gates I find that hard um but you know to have those moments of complicity where you've got people you can actually can under have an understanding with who seem to come from a completely different world 
you know, who are a different generation to you, have different views about animals than you do, who have different feelings about their animals than you do, and understand at the base of it that you've got a deep love of animals that connects both of you in that moment. And it was just lovely, you know, just having this little chat with this guy. Uh, I'm not saying I want to go out with him and watch him while he's, you know, trying to shoot pigeons or whatever it is that he does, but you know it was just that, that moment of understanding um that I've had many of those moments with those clients and those are the moments that I really just I look for I think they're so important um rather than looking for the things that are division and clutching our pearls because I think a lot of us are pearl clutchers aren't we including myself um oh how dreadful your hunter and and it's very easy to get into that kind of purse lips pearl clutch um, and just to have that moment where you've got some elderly guy telling you, and probably the first person he's ever told that he, uh, all his seven dogs sleep in his bed with him, and you're, you know, you're not judging him for it like probably his mates might. Um, so I liked that. This is really cool because it kind of uh, connects us into talking about your consultancy work you do for trainers and also your book, um, mm -hmm. Client Centered Dog Training. Uh, which we can talk about because <clears throat> uh, we can connect so much. We can connect through joy, happiness. We can connect through pain. We can find a way of connecting through and it's being available to that. And I think one thing about this thing about being available. So in that moment, then you weren't looking to meet him. It was just a chance, yeah. choice encounter. Uh, and in that moment, you were both available to each other's truths and you found that mm -hmm. connectivity. One thing about being available uh, as I, that's kind of the terminology I use. Um, it's okay not to be sometimes. And I think that's something to recognize. And I think, you know, when you think about some of the things we get involved with, the passions that we feel, especially on our side of the industry, mm -hmm. it's okay to have those sometimes. It's okay to think, do you know, um, I can't really be available to that discussion or I don't have, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not emotionally available enough to get into that discussion there. Mm -hmm. But equally on the other side when we think about especially working with our clients we have to allow ourselves to form a process with that client so that because quite often or sometimes at least their world view of dogs their world view of their own dog is potentially a 180 to us and yeah. potentially 180 to the dog's care needs yeah and oh you think it's 180 but is it really because I've had that. I've had those moments where totally, you know, going into something with, I, I, half of my life is in, is with the shelter. And I see, uh, the, the guard dogs suffer. And the dogs that have come from the protection they suffer in kennels. And I've got, um, she was the worst dog in the shelter. And she's come, from, she's purpose. Malinois. I have ish, I have feel how some of these dogs are trained and I've been part of investigations for One Voice um, where we were videoing what was going on in some of the to make an expose to have the French government intervene because um, the use of whips and chains is common um, the use of tasers is now popular so just to kind of people aren't always aware that these things happen in the industry and I got a reputation for working with dogs who'd come from club. That's what they call it in France. They call it club. So they've been to club. And if a man rings me up and says he's taken his dog to club and the dog's been kicked out, uh, viré, I know full well that that dog doesn't have bite stimulus control. So the dog's just basically biting anything that moves. And having to work with those people, has I originally had kind of big feelings about and thought that same thing as you did, that it was 180, that they were, they, they see the dog as a tool, that any training is fine, that uh, uh, things that I consider to be abuse of the dog is absolutely acceptable. And uh, to, you know, really using the, the dog as a status symbol and all of these things were hit press, pressing all of my buttons, you know, they pressed all of my ragey buttons and to actually know that when I have these big guys who come in when I say to them what do you want out of your relationship with the dog and they're looking for things you know when I say they say oh respect okay so you want a dog that looks at you and loves you and they're kind of going yeah that's what I want you know and they're looking at the dog as they're saying it and I'm saying you love that dog you've done crappy things to that dog and I'm thinking that in my head but what they're coming from is that same they want a relationship they don't want this kind of 
thing that I thought that they wanted. And so often I see that. And that for me was really eye-opening uh, because I went in for those first ones kind of thinking, I mean, I've been there with men who grow men crying over what they've done to the dog and dog armor induced um, behaviors. And they're weeping simply because I've taken a non-judgmental stance to it. And I'm kind of there, and I'm often the first person that they've ever told how they actually feel about it. And I think when you unpick it, are they are, are people really 180 from us? Or are, are, are we kind of all just shades of grey on a big old spectrum where nothing is clear and we wish it was? <laughs> you know, we'd That's like to be able point. to put people into compartments, don't we? And think you are different than me, rather than thinking, you just want your dog to look at you with love and uh, to feel that. And that's the same thing I like with mine, you know? And that's really important. I think this comes to awareness, doesn't it? So um, I've had something similar myself with, like say, like say, grown men crying over what they've done in the past. Yeah. And that's that moment of awareness. And I think, yeah. and I think that notion of non-judgmental intervention is key, isn't it? Because some of those, we all know about how uh, our kind of worldview, our beliefs are often protected by our brain with various biases and distortions and whatever else. And there's nothing quicker to get somebody's barriers up than for them to feel judged. Mm -hmm. Yep. So our language, so what I'm getting from what you're saying there, what you're describing is how important the language is for you, what you're kind of shining back to them from their own words to you. Yeah, I think so. And also, I think it comes back to self-management that, yes, I have big feelings and it's OK to have big feelings and it's OK to be, you know, flamboyant and exuberant and whatever else and, and to feel passionately, which I do. I feel very passionately about um, the shelter community and, and about, you know, various causes that I've float my boat. But being able to kind of say, OK, well, I have these things and I'm just going to leave them and let the story run a little bit. Um, I think is always the, you know, my starting point, because uh, we're never going to, I think if we're only preaching to the converted, if we're only ever dealing with clients who feel exactly the same way that we do about our animals, well, we might as well not bother, you know, they can go on YouTube and find some really great videos. And I'm sure that because they're that dedicated already to the dog's welfare and the dog's progress, that they can practically do it themselves. You know, they don't need me there. I'm just like a cheerleader. That's all I am. But I'm interested in changing hearts and minds, because if we're going to change the communities, if we're going to change, you know, to, thinking about Stephen Covey's kind of seven um, spheres of influence, whatever it is, if I'm going to change the hearts and minds of the, the community around me, then that starts with listening to the community around me. I can't do that if I'm in conflict with them. Um, and it's, it's that, isn't it? It's widening our spheres of influence. And we can only do that if we're open to those discussions. And I think it can be hard. And the hardest bit of that is going, big feelings coming along. I'm going to park these for a minute, deal with them afterwards, because this person needs my attention right now. Because also, how like selfish is it that I can't even sit in a conversation and listen to somebody talking, you know, without my own, in, my own big emotions coming in and sitting there like, hello, like the big elephant in the room. Um, and getting in the way of everything because also and Kathy Sadeo and um, Chris Packle were talking about this in the lounge uh, yesterday and I was so nodding my head and so agreeing my, what my work with aggressive clients and my work with people surrendering dogs to the shelter depends on me having their truth and I need that truth to understand what's happened to that dog because if I don't understand what's happened to the dog, well, I, I don't know what I'm working with. And if people haven't told me, oh, well, we tried this. I tried to use a prong collar. I tried to use a shock collar. Even I've had people say I've tasered the dog, you know. Um, and, okay. Um, if I can't, if I'm bringing my judgment to that, all that's going to happen is they're going to clam up and disappear and go elsewhere. So... I, uh, you know, I, I wonder how many clients we kind of like losing and we may not want to work with them, you know, it may be too difficult for us. And I appreciate that totally. I think if we're not in a place where we can do that, I think that it's fine to say I'm not in a place where I can do this. We're human beings. We don't have to go out there and fight every cause. Um, but, but if we are and we're in that place where we can go, do you know what? I have these big feelings. I may tell you them. I know I've had that as well. Five minutes down the line when you've got rapport with someone. 
you can say, well, that was the stupidest thing you've ever done, wasn't it? Uh, you know, when you've got rapport, you've got that ability to kind of go, uh, well, I don't think you want to do that, do you? Um, or, OK, well, we don't need to do that again. So I think that's important as well, that where we where we build in rapport because we've listened and we've, you know, um, we've often got that flexibility to say the things that we otherwise feel like we couldn't. Um, which has led to some, you know, interesting and honest conversations too. And that, what I'm getting from that again is, because uh, when we think about rapport, that's connection, right? And, and mm -hmm. you keep using the word listening all the time. And I think that's something we've all got to become better at because I'm um, being truly available to that truth of another, you know, um, because at some point we've got to try and become available to the truth of the dog, right? Um, yes. But we can't start there. We've got to get, that connection and I think it's and you important. can't get to the dog unless you go through the people yeah. you know how many dogs do we fail because we can't get through to the people you know it, it depends on them and it depends and it's their relationship ultimately it's not our relationship and neither is it our kind of like gold standard gold star relationship of how we would see it um and i think that too and i i feel like that's what causes us to have quite a lot of inner conflict where we're kind of like we go out and we're preaching of this is how you should have a relationship this is how you should be doing it this is how you should manage it um that quite often we feel in our heart that kind of seed of i i don't think i'm doing this myself <laughs> you know um and if we're honest with ourselves Sometimes I think we just ride it out and we just feel uncomfortable about it without really understanding why. But sometimes I think we have those moments where we can go, I've been there, I've done that, you know? Um, I know what this feels like to have a dog that I can't work with and I can't live with and, you know, to, have, to be at my end of my tether and to not be able to cope. Um, so I think that's an important aspect as well. And I think also what you, that's brilliant because I, I think, in my experience, when speaking to clients, sharing my own stories of frustrations with my own dogs, uh, talking about my, you know, my own kind of frailties and sensitivities can be a great way totally. for them to kind of connect sometimes to build a bit of a bridge. And um, uh, the we can, something else you said a moment ago as well, which I think is really important as well, is also recognizing when we're not in the state or in the right place to kind of make those connections sometimes we all have some clients fine. that we work with and actually we've, um, we've also, also had clients where we've worked with them they weren't necessarily in the right space for that message yes. or that connection yeah. and then maybe 12 months later they come back again because they're ready then totally. uh, and I think it's just recognizing those things but also giving ourselves a bit of self-love on that side of things but we, we can't fight and win every battle and we shouldn't really see it as a battle we should be seeing it as a way of can I connect can we find that way to find yeah. that middle ground but we've got to be open to finding the middle ground in the first place right yeah we do and and I think that can be hard as well because if we set a kind of a, like a gold standard of what the relationship should look like then what we're doing is we, we're just it's kind of coming back to a compliance model again that we have an idealized model about what the dog relationship should look like with a human being and then we're kind of like imposing on that on them and then it comes back to that who am I to tell you how to rule your life with your dog you know if you want to have your dog on your couch um had this morning it was lovely uh, a, a client she'd um she's been bitten by a dog and she was trying to remove her Labrador from the couch for um various reasons and she had been quite it's fairly bitten um and you know we can go in with all of our kind of like ugh, um how could you have been so stupid to try and move your dog from the couch okay we can go in with that mentality and go in with the don't try and move a dog for a sleeping dog from the couch you, you know this is but she's lived nine years with that dog and never done that before and it reminds me of a time I on the 14th of June this date is very clear in my mind for reasons that will become clear um, on the 14th of June at 10 to, no, 20 to 9, I got a phone call from my estate agent to say, uh, are you ready? And I went, ready for what? And he went, were you moving today? And I went, no, I don't think so. Are you joking? Is this a joke? And he went, no, we've got a meeting at 10 o'clock at, uh, at the solicitors to sign the paperwork. And I went, oh, shit. 
and everything in my world it just kind of went I was kind of prepared I knew I was moving it wasn't that much of a shock but in that moment I'd called my friend Ruth and said you know can you come over and help me move a couple of bits of furniture out and, and so on because there was not much left and just really for a bit of emotional support in that moment um and she did now Liddy is a herding dog and when I get stressed she's stressed and she also likes to herd and nip and she's got a bite history now she knows Ruth very well and Ruth came over to my head at uh, my house and I've got, I'd got baby gates the baby gates were still there I was leaving the baby gate in fact um and the simplest thing to do would have been to put Liddy behind the gate did I it would have taken me 30 seconds Liddy would not have been upset about that we'd done it a million times what did I do I let her herd us while we're trying to move a coffee table out of the house. You know, what did Liddy do? Nip and try and herd my friend Ruth. And we've we've all been, I think, in probably those situations with our own dogs where we've done, oh God, why didn't I do that? You know, uh, five years I've had this dog and I've managed her for every single moment of those five years. And it was because I was stressed and everything was changing and then we just forget our habits. So when the lady came to me this morning and said, you know, I've moved my dog off the, the couch and she's already, we all know we've done something wrong, don't we? <laughs> we know not one of us needs yet. I didn't need, think you wanted to do that. Um, but we can go in with that kind of mentality, even when we're not saying it, rather than going in with a kind of a view of we're human beings, we do shit stuff from time to time, you know, most of us do a really good job functioning on a daily basis and managing to keep our hair brushed and find our socks, you know, and not go out of the house without our trousers off. Um, and I think it can be really uncompassionate, I feel sometimes, if we're going in with the, well, you, we needed to have done it this way and this way and this way, because our life isn't like that, is it? And I think if we're all honest with them, so maybe it's just me, maybe I'm just the only stupid one, but um, we do all have those moments where we've just gone, oh God, you know, what, what was I thinking? Um, and luckily nothing has happened from it. So I don't think we're in any position to sit in judgment over the, and um, put our pearls over the people who have made those errors in their life and kind of like now coming to us. And also, cause they've come to us. And I get a lot of that where clients have approached us, they want help. And then if I'm seeing a kind of a drift, and that's one reason I wrote client-centered dog training, because we shouldn't see very much of a drift, should we? If clients are asking for help and saying, you know, I've got a problem, I need some help, we shouldn't see any drift from them, should we? Really speaking, because we're, we're kind of saying, okay, well, I can help here. Um, and everything should be fine. So I was kind of interested into why clients drop out, why sometimes there's that resistance from clients. And it comes back to kind of my, my earlier career in uh, organization change management. Because if you try to change one individual, try chasing a huge organization. You know, it's like turning a, an enormous ship around in the middle of the ocean. So I was very kind of conscious of that. And I think sometimes that can be a, a very powerful message for dog trainers that human beings are complex and they don't change for a number of reasons uh, but stress is one of those reasons just exactly like it is for our dogs you know when do things go wrong with our dogs when the, mo the dog's suffering from some kind of change of circumstances and then you know perfect storm and so on so I think ultimately that's why I find it easy to kind of put my own values and judgments aside because I've been there um, and if I haven't been exactly I don't need to have been exactly there but I have failed my dogs at times, um, you know, and I failed myself at times and thought, oh my God, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I, whatever. Um, and we can't just dwell on it all the time, can we? And nitpick over it and oh, beat ourselves up about it because we'll never make any change. What matters is the change. What matters is the learning. Coming back to earlier things about learning. What do we do afterwards? You know, okay. So now I'm going to make sure that when I move house and the, the estate agent gives me um, 20 minutes to get out of my own house, that next time I'm going to put Liddy behind the baby gate, you know, and that's my learning. Um, but my learning is more profound than that. My learning is much more, oh, my God, when we're under stress, then we do even more crappy things than normal. Um which I think is powerful, which is why I'd really, I, I loved Laura Donaldson. And it was very timely um, when she was talking about um, Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. 
because I found myself realizing that in moments where I was thinking fast and making those instinctive decisions and stressed uh, that I was actually making poor choices sometimes for the, for the animals that I got in my care and that we see that all the time with our clients. And this is really important you've really eloquently given some good examples there as well about how complicated and often dysfunctional the space is around our clients when they first reach out to us and part of our job is to navigate through that with them um and uh yeah. that that view that they might have when we think about expectations and all that kind of thing we have to kind of invite them to come with us on a way so they can go through that reappraisal themselves because it's more authentic for them then isn't it and, and I think that the temptation yeah. more traditionally is to turn up with a very operant toolkit and not have to connect to the client so much but then we run the risk of course of the the client just doing things following a prescription without necessarily knowing why or or even necessarily addressing their own emotional load that comes in with it and I love when we spoke before off air uh, a little while ago about how you recognize all the different hats you end up putting on when you're with that person. Because invariably through that story of that, that relationship with their dog is also the story of that person's relationship with their family, with their work, with their life. There's just so many bits that come out through those threads, isn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. Um, that bit about what you said about the relationship with the family, um, it, the client this morning, she'd been contacted by one of the guys who had, um, who, who I know from the shelter and he'd given it all the judgment to his mother and some bad information, you know, that the, will make him get off the couch and be the boss and so on. Um, so I'm kind of going in knowing that she's had to go to hospital because the dog has bitten her and it's, you know, she can't just brush it off or disguise it I mean it's been medical treatment um and that she realizes she's been foolish in front of her child which can be really hard uh, when your child is there luckily I know you know her son very well and know also he's made mistakes in his life and done things you know so uh, he, uh, and he knows me and he knows I made mistakes and things so I think it's that nice kind of openness and that comes back to what you were saying about maybe sharing uh, and that's why I liked your post earlier in the week about sharing um, things that we haven't curated, you know, the moments, the genuine moments. I think that's really important for people to see. Um, because if we give this kind of robotic, I'm great, you're crap message, essentially, um, pe people are going to be switched off by that and uh, are going to hide things from us that we need to know, um, essential things, you know, um, and who are going to feel even unnecessarily that we might judge them before we even know the situation. Um, so I had an interesting discussion um, uh, about uh, kind of like when you're a, as an influencer, I guess, I'm not an influencer in any shape or form, but when you're a public figure, whether you should kind of share your story and what happens when your story goes wrong, and then the kind of like, should you, as my dad said, put your head, he's always saying, stop putting your head up above the parapet if you don't want to get shot. Okay, uh, you know, but I think it's important, as, as you did with your post, to be honest and to be authentic and to say this is my real life with my real dog, rather than just presenting this curated, um, you know, very, very curated chosen pieces of our lives that give the impression that all is rosy and wonderful and that we're living in some kind of, you know, um wonderful city of Oz or something where everything is hunky dory uh, and it's not to say that we should be going out either and going I'm crap and doing myself a disservice you know but it's uh, it's about that balance isn't it and I think that can be a bit difficult to to get especially on social media where people are going to read whatever they like into it and you have no control over how, what they do with it yeah and that's uh, and this is the thing about you know um understanding different the two sides of the coin really when we think about what we do ourselves and why we do things okay it's 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 complicated and there's lots of reasons <laughs> and and often the thing that we're having a bit of an explosion about it isn't about that thing it's about all this other stuff totally. or whatever else mm -hmm. but also recognizing that we are quite judgmental as a species uh, you know the two things we know about our humans is we like to judge and we hate to be judged right this, yes this uh, but and, and i think even understanding that and this is why i think your books are so brilliant and i think it's really important that trainers generally understand more about the psychology of expectations and judgments because as soon as you turn up that day 
that client will, will already have a set of judgments and expectations that we have to navigate through with them. Mm -hmm. but I think understanding that psychology helps a little bit because um, that post you're talking about when I was just talking about my own dogs are uh, really well received actually. But somebody mm -hmm. sent me uh, something from in a group where somebody had shared it saying, oh, this sounds like excuses, excuses to me. You know, and I was thinking, okay, but I know that's Realizing. just the, that's just the lens they've seen it through. And I think yeah. that's, we've got to allow ourselves to recognize that um, it's just part of the human condition, right? I think I totally. quick thinking brain, especially yet they will yeah. see a few words or they hear a few things that you say and their own belief filter will twist that. And that's why we've got to be aware of that process when working with clients, we've got to yeah. try and navigate through that and i love this notion that is pushed through a lot through the book about trying to look for collaboration ahead of compliance yeah i mean it's so important that kathy sadeo also talked about that with chris packle and mike shikasho i think every we kind of come into that kind of you know how you have those memes in the zeitgeist that are just it's timely isn't it i think we're all talking about we don't I don't work with a compliance model with dogs I don't you know my dogs are wherever they want to be I don't compliance is just uh, that door as long as it's bolted a horse as long as it's bolted in terms of compliance my dogs um and I'm very much about choice and consent and cooperation with my dogs and and adaptation as well you know finding that uh, Karen overall uses that beautiful expression a negotiated settlement um that kind of that compromise that middle ground that works for everybody and it might be that you don't get some of your needs met but most of your needs will be met um with the, through that negotiated settlement and i love that idea um so i i think i'm kind of coming to it with that view that we're never going to get everything to be completely our way they're just quite nice to be able to know that we can have those negotiated settlements that we that's what we're doing really is that we're negotiating a settlement for those people with their animals um and for the animals on you know what's their basic needs and making sure that they get met um and i would never do that in a com compliance model and then on the other hand I read a lot of science papers where they say well these behavior modifications and medications are all fine as long as the client is compliant and kind of thinking really <laughs> okay so i'm working with animals who i'm giving more rights about their choices to than the humans that they, <laughs> who are responsible for, for enacting that, that freedom, that space for the dog, and I'm not giving them the choice. Um, and also it's destined to fail, isn't it? So if we go in, like I have, we all have preferences of things that I've done that have worked that have been massively reinforcing for me, and great, that's wonderful, operant conditioning 101. But then to go in and kind of like impose that then on somebody else, well, I like hand touch. Hand touch works really well for me and Liddy. Heston hates hand touch because I taught him to be really gentle when approaching hands. So when I ask him for hand touch, it's like, really, must I get near your hand? And he's like a millimeter away from my hand. It just doesn't work for him. And I have clients who are just like, no, nope, that's not going to work for me. It's not going to work for my dog. Sometimes when picking that helps understand things and that can be great, but it's about finding, it's knowing that there are, when you talk uh, about um, kind of like task oriented, there are a hundred ways that we can approach a problem. There's not just one and finding the one way that works for the client is the important thing, you know, and that will be the, the, the thing that will work for them and their dog. Um, and that's where I kind of feel my role is, is looking at, the, okay, well, let's, which of these do you think would work? And I don't give them a million choices because I don't think people are very good with a million choices. Like having moved back to the UK for the summer, oh my God, your vegan shops, like I can't pick my food. I'm standing there going like, well, I just get beans in France. That's it. You know, beans and lentils. That's my living in rural France. If you want to go to the supermarket and be vegan, you have about three choices, all of which will involve beans. You go in the UK <laughs> supermarket, I'm like, vegan mayonnaise? Who invented this stuff? You know? And I feel like sometimes our clients are a bit like that. They've got too much choice. So I'll say, okay, well, here are three things that you could do, which do you think might fit best for you in this circumstance? And this would work. Um, like, for instance, if we just take bat, lat, and um normal just desensitization some clients just seem to just take to counter conditioning it's beautiful you know it's perfect and then other clients 
well, they need engage, disengage. Other clients need la, other clients need ba. So it's about finding the right tool, isn't it, for the job. It's about knowing, and that comes to understanding the dog and understanding the person and being able to appraise how it is working for them um, and what would best fit their situation and so on. So uh, coming back to that idea of a negotiated settlement, it, that's also about which tools am I going to take out of my toolbox that are going to work for these people? Um, so, and, and that's really important because that's that awareness again, isn't it? I think of somebody else's emotional, where they are kind of emotionally invested in that situation or, or what their own emotional experience is. Because we've all worked with clients. Um, I had a client quite recently, actually, who had had a very good protocol and, and behavioral um, plan put together by somebody. Mm-hmm. But the bit that hadn't been taken account for was her own anxieties, her own generalized anxieties. And actually some of the things she was being asked to do, it wasn't the dog who was out of their comfort zone now, it was her. Mm -hmm. And I think it's such an important part that gets missed Mm -hmm. a lot, doesn't it, about what, and often the dogs kind of move forwards perhaps quicker than the caregiver does. And and Mm -hmm. it's recognizing that that caregiver is still experiencing a lot of those negative associations with doing that work or being in that environment. Yeah, that's so true. That just reminds me of one of my very lovely clients. Um, I, I mostly the cases I deal with the dog bites. So it's not that I have like hundreds of dog bites. It's just that I, that's what I specialize in. So this lady is, um, she she'd gone as far as she was capable to. I always think we've got kind of it's a very simple model, um, but we've always got like four things to consider with our clients. One is their kind of like their external uh, locus of control, which is uh, which is um, their ability and the environment that they're in. So I'm looking at clients kind of thinking, do they have the ability? And this lady just didn't have the ability. She had the environment, she could keep the dog safe and that was fine. Um, Also their intentions and how much exertion they can put in. Because she had the, you know, she had really wonderful intentions for the dog. She wanted to have that cafe life dog that many of my clients want. And then they get a shelter dog or, you know, a puppy that grows up in and doesn't want to fit into that life. Um, But she just, she was at her full capacity in terms of how much more energy she could exert into it. Now, I am not a fan of boot camps. I'm not a fan of taking things off the client. Um, As you know from, from the book, I think, you, it's up to them to do it unless they do it themselves you know we can't impose something on them it won't stick so I'm very much a kind of like I don't work like that you have to do it yourself you know I'm going to help you do it yourself but you need to do it and this lady she was so out of a depth and she was anxious and she was struggling and the dog was further along than she was that I just kind of went okay can you give me the dog for the afternoon <laughs> which is totally against every principle that I've got um, uh, so that I can train her to do this thing that she's going to do when she sees another dog um, and now things are fine um, you know so it just it, the dog needed actually the thing that I was morally opposed to doing a clutching my pearls about and actually made her feel better it wasn't empowering and totally able to talk about the tensions of doing that and I hate doing it for all of those reasons um because it's totally disempowering isn't it you take the dog off them and go god give it here I'll just do it um and also that's my I I, I'm very good at doing that let me do it for you (laughs) I'll just go to step in and do it for you and take over and control things um so I did that with a lot of hesitation on myself because I know that's how that's my fault I can tend to barge in and do things myself and knowing that actually she needed that and then we could do the other things you know so we could then take her to the dog um to a part where there were lots of dogs moving around and so on and to see her come out of herself and see that the dog was fine and she could cope and for me actually to be there I did no training I was just like there for the sandwiches (laughs) I was I was there for the picnic and the chat and that's what we did is we walked and we chatted um and that's what she needed was five or six walks with me there just in case um, to be kind of like, I don't know, a buffer just in case anything did happen. And that kind of started then to rebuild her confidence a bit, um, which can be a real sticking point. So when we understand our clients and we can give them what they need, then the dog benefits from that. But sometimes that means doing things that we're kind of like morally opposed to doing from time to time. Two really important points out of that. First is I love what you said there about you did what she needed, you, you did what she needed, as in the client needed, and that's okay sometimes. And I think actually yeah. it's, it's it's important. And also this thing about 
um, not being too precious ourselves. So it's okay sometimes to, to you know, everything we believe in and we think we're going to do is to throw that out sometimes if it's what's needed. Yes. And um, uh, and I've done it myself. I had a client before lockdown happened, before the COVID came, where um, I ended up throwing everything out the bloody window with that dog, to be honest. <laughs> but there is something about the lady, something about the dog. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have to have these kind of boundaries. I like the, I like the kind of phrase... Um, uh boundaries not barriers yeah uh and Absolutely. sometimes there's a there's a case that just gets you and it's often it's about the dog but sometimes it's about the person i think right yeah. you know i'm just gonna really just do more I think, here do you not think it's out. always about the person i think you're right actually because i think it has to be that doesn't it because mm. you know that's they're the ones that we really kind of attach into isn't it because we yeah. end up really thinking right there is something about you and this is that thing about that rapport that connection sometimes yes. these connections happen i remember years ago i worked with a lady who uh in that when in the one session she she stormed out the room and then <laughs> later on in the session she locked me in a in another room she locked me in it okay so that was a great start so you think well that's a bit odd it was a bit odd but, um, <laughs> a bit odd. but you know got a low, low value of odd <laughs> i ended up loving her and we had yeah. the most amazing relationship because that there was that side of her that I really there's something about that just, so you find connections sometimes in the oddest places not always people that you mirror or are the same as it's just something <laughs> that gets you and you think right we're gonna because if we all end up in that kind of echo chamber of people who think and behave like us we forget the rest of we isolate ourselves from the rest of the human experience mm. um you know, there's a reason I picked Liddy out of the shelter because something about that dog who was experiencing incredible difficulties in the shelter. I mean, first time I met Liddy, she grabbed my ponytail and held on for it for five minutes and dragged me around a kennel, which was nice. nice. Um, and I was there to do a behavioral assessment on her to see if it was for euthanasia. But she's the one. When she goes, hopefully not anytime soon. I am going to be bereft. And I had the same with Flicker. So Flicker had been in seven homes before she turned up in our shelter. Um, funnily enough, the last time Liddy bit me was the day I met Flicker. Uh, I think those two, Flicker turned up, she was, she was 14, no, she was, yeah, 14, I think at the time. And she had a nosebleed on my foot. And it, I, just like I was saying just to you before, I take dogs home just because, like, ugh, I can't leave you in the shelter, can I? You're 14 years old, old Malinois with your nose dripping. I've never seen a dog have a nosebleed. So I took her home, and I tried desperately to find a home for her for six months because she was impossible to live with. Um, she, she just, like, uh, she'd had seven homes before me that I knew of and been in the shelter twice, and they were incredible. You know, she had separation anxiety. Well, it turned out to be confinement issues. Uh, she barked at everything that moved she was she would go in your handbag and grab all your food she was counter surfing I mean have you ever lived with an old lady that counter surfs she could barely move and I found her one day in the chicken coop like eating chicken food and you know but that dog we lived through those moments that were most complicated moments and I just when she died I was utterly bereft because it was so much richer that relationship because of all that we'd kind of been through together um because they're the biggest characters aren't they and I think it's the same with our clients mm. um that the ones who are the biggest pains in the butt um and the ones that are the hardest to win over are the ones that we sometimes develop the most rapport with because we see them at their worst um often and we see them also how how big their journey has been and I think we're always interested in that aren't we that, I mean that's why we watch things like Britain's Got Talent we love to uh, Strictly and so on we like to see people's journey we're interested in that journey we're fascinated in people's starting points and and where they end up and so I think that's why it's so rewarding for us when we do have those clients that make those amazing journeys um, and they're the ones that we truly prize I think above all the others. And again, you, you really identified something really important there, this notion of the journey and also how, looking back on the, the lady, the one who um, stormed out and then locked me in or all the kind of <laughs> things we went through. As we moved on in our relationship together, our working relationship, she had a, we were talking about kind of worldviews and that. And um, uh, part of the issue there is, of course, is you're absolutely right. On a, the thing that we connect in 
is our love and our compassion and our, and our desire to do right by our dog. The thing that can mm-hmm. get in the way sometimes is if on another layer there, you either have a cultural or a life experience or you know, the zeitgeist is still the dominance model and all this kind of thing, which can actually mm-hmm. stop the individual even accessing some of that sometimes because yeah. this is how I expect those are kind of expectations. And she shared with me later on down the line how painful it was to let go of some of this stuff. And actually then she shared with me how she's brought up by a very strict um, authoritarian uh, father. Then how her late husband was also had a certain worldview about women and all these kind of things. And then I was almost tearing apart without meaning to a a, a view on her. And that's where some of these kind of things come from. So I think we have to recognize that for some people, it's quite painful separation of other things that, that we're asking them or inviting them to go through. I don't even think that's just some people. I think that's a lot of people because yeah. dogs are an extension of ourselves, aren't, aren't they? And they yeah. say so much about us. You know, um, I like to take on troubled people. and I, I'm a helper of people. And as I, my worst bit is, you know, being a kind of savior of people is always bring people home and say, mom, this is Michaela. She's been kicked out of her home. Can, can Michaela stay for like, I don't know, until she gets back on her feet or mom, this is Mark. Can he stay? He's probably an alcoholic, uh, but he's a very nice person. I just met him this afternoon. So I was always that person bringing, collecting things home. And my dogs are very much a collection of, of my it, experiences you know they're an extension of myself and they always will be um that I like to kind of take on those um uh, dogs that are kind of a, a maybe a bit of an outsider or really need the home or just need a bit of a boost or whatever um and so whenever we look at people and we're looking at uh, their relationships with dogs what we're often looking at is their relationship with themselves um and their relationship as well with their family um so you know so often that people go in when I was talking before about uh, intentions so often people go in and they're not always aware of their intentions when you ask them like why did you pick this dog why did you choose this dog what do you like about this dog um you know that can be really interesting about so often that they want to um they've got so many interesting stories that really are a reflection of themselves and a reflection of their life it's very personal the relationship we have with our dogs very personal and this is why I think uh, the huge loss we experience when we say goodbye to our dogs yeah. it's a recognition that it's not just about the the physical loss of a, of a faithful companion that dog has come to represent so much through our lives they've borne witness to so much in our lives they've been yeah. there through all these things and it's a big thing and I think um, there is also a grieving process a little bit when we get involved between that expectation, that view of the dog they think they have or want, and then the sudden reality of, right, so this is very different. Yes. There is a, that that is a painful process as well sometimes. Yeah, it It is. It can be quite a difficult process. And we have that as well with our relationships. I mean, just thinking about Flickr, um, I don't think it was coincidental Uh, that you know my grandmother had just gone into a nursing home at that time and you kind of like it's almost like surrogate caring for a being Uh, because I would happily have moved in with my grandmother but she said it was like living with Stalin in the gulag because I tried to make her drink more water uh, because she was like so dehydrated and she was you know I give her one thing she's like I'm drowning in liquid my kidneys are floating like you've had one teaspoon of water Um, and so to hear her complaining after 24 hours so if I can't care for my nana well caring for an elderly dog fills that that need that I have right at the moment to do something um Mm. and so sometimes we can be looking at uh, the relationship and I think that's why it fascinates me and why I like it because it's such a private and intimate relationship normally I mean how often people what whatever you put on social media whether however often you walk your um uh, your dogs and whatever most of what we do with our dogs is a very private experience inside um inside the home and in uh, um and, and so on and so we're really intruding into that kind of world as well which can be uncomfortable for some client for many clients i think right so we're i can't believe it the hour's gone uh emma <laughs> uh um but 
this is why I think your book's really important. And um, any of our trainers, professionals listening, I think actually anybody involved in the dogs there, Kekta, can get something from their book. Even if you're not a trainer, if you're if you're a groomer or uh, anything, I think there's a lot of really good information about making sure that we, we can be more available, I think. So the book's called uh, Client-Centered Dog Training. Um, I was going to talk a bit about rescue today, but maybe you'd like to come along again and we can do a rescue one. Because, uh, you, you know, um, when I first uh, got to know you, you were very heavily doing a lot of stuff around rescue. And I think there's a lot of things that you offer insight wise that is really helpful not just for people in working in rescue or trainers and behaviors working with rescues but also those who take in a rescue i think there's a lot that we can unpack there um your writing uh, you know i was a big fan of uh, i found connected to you through your writing really so what the wolf like to meet Mm -hmm. blogs um uh, i'll make sure we put some links in for this stuff and of course more recently you've been writing courses for dog genius i have Teresa's listening in. I, I, I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Dog genius. Uh, so D O G E N I U S. Um, yeah. And you do quite a lot of stuff with them. And there's there's a lot of really good accessible courses through Dog Geniuses. It's not all about academic style things for really geeky no. trainers. Uh, the general public can find a lot through the. Yeah, and I think some of those courses are the most useful ones, like the canine body language courses and um, the rescue courses that Irene um, Parrott has written are just, um, you know, amazing. So there's, there is something for everybody in there. And I think that was one of the things that I wanted to do when I started writing for them was I looked at a lot of the dog training courses and I needed, uh, for me, something more for the human side you know um I mean I'm a teacher so I know about running classes on a Friday afternoon when you've got 30 teenagers and they have to learn Romeo and Juliet you know it's not very different than having a load of huskies um who you're trying to teach obedience to so uh, the, the, there were aspects that I felt were missing certainly in some aspects of dog training that I felt could be better addressed um by somebody who had a bit of experience at wrestling with uh teenagers who don't want to learn Romeo and Juliet because you know it's the worst thing in the world that they could possibly do on a Friday afternoon especially if it's snowing um so there's I'd like to think there's something for everyone um I'm very human centered because a lot of the elements on that are about the canine the human canine interactions human canine relationships um our our relationship as a species with dogs as a species which were quite new and interesting, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is where we've got to, um, you know, I always have quite a philosophical view of things. I think that's what we need to do sometimes. We need to step back a bit and have mm -hmm. a wider view. Uh, and I think one thing I think we can perhaps sum up the whole hour on really is a recognition that most people, if not all people, are trying to do the best they can with the yeah. knowledge, the time, and like you said earlier, the emotional capacity that they have. Yeah, we're all doing the best we can. We all are in the best and in the best way we know how. And we don't deserve judgment. We deserve compassion for doing that. Um, yeah. And it is true that when we know better, we do better. But I don't think that we can always fulfill that dream. I like to that's an aspiration, isn't it? That when we know better, we do better because I don't think that's always true. Sometimes we do know better and we still don't do it. You know? This comes back um, to this notion of privilege a little bit, uh, generally, because yeah. privilege as a concept is, is, is very wide. And actually, I think about my own, um, my own health troubles this last kind of year or two. Uh, there's been times where I know better, but my own physical uh, um, uh, abilities I meant I couldn't do that. I couldn't totally. do that. I, How I couldn't many people be can't restrain themselves from making comments on Facebook or on other social media that are totally inappropriate and we really wish we'd not said, you know, if we can't even stop our own fingers typing things on a keyboard. Yeah. And like you said, about diet, about health, about our own psychological kind of well-being, we don't always, we, we do sometimes know better. Quite often we know better. And that's one thing I think about the client-centered model is accepting that actually people know the reason, they know what's going to work for them. Um, and that's awfully empowering to say, like to the lady this morning who'd taken a dog off the sofa, okay, well, what is, what's going to work for you? Because I don't think training, you know, she's 70, she, she's, she, she's, I said, well, management. Um, and we'd had this kind of discussion about um, 
bribery because I said well this is one way I went into the kitchen and said does anyone want a biscuit and my dogs got off the couch and ran in the kitchen and she said oh is that not bribery I went does it work and she went yes well I said do you do it already and she went oh yes I said well just do that then if you want your dog to get off the couch um you know so again it comes back to that I think that client-centered way of working um that sometimes we can work better if we're thinking of the you know the human behind it and I think the uh what a really poor little gem there just to finish off with that you mentioned there is I think when you start looking at connecting more through the emotional experience being more available to looking at the kind of dynamic and that when we adopt more of a care approach and more mm -hmm. of a compassionate approach that brings out the same with the client often and yes. actually it's far easier to suggest management then to a client actually I find once they're like once we once they've realized actually yeah my dog's stressed and I'm stressed neither of us enjoy going to that particular place then we can say well why not no why not there? not go there then and then like, okay, <laughs> if I'd have started off the conversation by saying well maybe you shouldn't take your dog down there it's going to yeah. get their heckles up aren't they like, hang on yeah. you're telling me what to do you know so yeah, yeah. And, and most people do know how to do better you know she'd live for yeah. nine years knowing how to manage that dog um and we do know better i live for five years with liddy putting her behind a baby gate so i knew better i just didn't do better in that moment so sometimes i think that acknowledgement as well that we're all just human beings doing human being stuff and it's great and it's complex and it's messy and i think just to enjoy the ride of it you know it's mm -hmm. fun it's it's nice to be able to say to people do you know what you messed up but hey let's move on um, and the recognition of the reflexive nature of many behaviours, mm -hmm. then they're, they're not behaviours that we thought about and shall I do this, okay. shall I do that, we just do it. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's not a good thing that we've done necessarily or helpful, but... No, and I think that's a cultural thing as well, because it's in a very individualistic cultures like the US and the UK, where funnily enough we believe in behaviour change more than maybe other societies might, um, that we believe that we can make changes and we don't be, like to believe that we're kind of fated to do things so i don't think we like the the fact that we're all little autonomous you know doing autonomous things and you know that every time i see something that annoys me on facebook i'm going to go to the fridge and stuff my face i don't like that kind of <laughs> being under that stimulus you know um so i think that's part of it as well but uh yeah the story's for another time yeah. maybe amazing so please look up we're going to make sure we put stuff in the thread and also i'm going to make sure we've got stuff in the general group anyway but uh emma's book uh client-centered dog training amazon is the place that people can get it is it is right? yes yeah. yeah yeah uh woof like to meet uh that's your personal website and where all the blogs are we, we mm -hmm. share a lot in the group uh, anyway There's something on there uh, everything on there <laughs> and then dog genius is uh where you do write for courses for people yeah. have a look at that uh, well, yep. great. So uh, anything coming up, Emma, soon that you want to tell us about? Nothing in particular. Order? I'm writing a book at the moment called 30 Conversations Dog Trainers Don't Want to Have and How to Win Them, uh, which is about all kinds of like, basically building on client centered tra uh, dog training, but just a little bit more specific and less theory. Um, not that there's very much theory in it at all. Uh, and then I'm also going to do one about shelter relationships um, and having shelter relationship, uh, how the shelter can perhaps function in a more client centered way, because I think that's a whole other 10 hours of, of me waffling. Um, mm. But I feel very passionate about that as well, that sometimes shelters are in the same position that we are sometimes that we shut ourselves off from the people who most need us. Um, and that can make us, you know, uh, complicated to access for the people who most need of our services um sometimes so there's that too so i'm doing those and i'm doing the two day uh, two afternoons really course on client-centered training for people who maybe don't have that human background and just want to know more and do but you know they don't know more and they want to do better um so there's that side as well and when's that it. coming up that's january i thought it was something new for you know new year new Brilliant. start if you want to improve your relationships with with your human clients <laughs> and is there still spaces for those courses yeah i'm only just doing a 10 i mean if it's popular and people want then i'll do another one but i wanted yeah. to keep it small enough and intimate enough that people could actually get into the things that really matter to them rather than doing it to like a cast of thousands um yeah. where you don't get that kind of ability to you know 
chew the fat and, and ponder things and really work it through. Well, keep us uh, updated in the Dog Centre Care Group, of course, about these things. And uh, you can share anything you like, Emma. You have a free reign. Uh, oh, don't say that. that. Yeah. Don't say that. I'll share some dreadful things that you'll be very embarrassed about. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it takes a lot to embarrass me, actually. I mean, but, uh, we'll, see. Um, well, thank you so much. So um, really appreciate your time today. It's been amazing. I can't believe how quickly time's gone. It'd be great to have you back again. Um, thank you, everybody who's tuning in today. Um, just to let everybody remind people, we've got the amazing Dawn Allen next week on the 30th. Loads of stuff to talk to Dawn about. Um, and uh, more coming up. I can't remember off the top of my head, which is terrible, isn't it? Uh, but uh, yeah, but Dawn's the next one. So that's the most important thing. Dawn's coming up next on the 30th. Well, thank you so much, Emma. Great talking to you. And uh, yeah, we'll catch up soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Bye.